you build your life on your faith. right into Christmas about it, shall we? And so let's go to Luke chapter 6 and let's read verse 2 through 14, a little bit of the Christmas story. And I want to do a message this morning, pretty simple, one word. Let's just start it out right here. The message today is called saved. <laughs> saved. You probably have never heard a message on saved like you're getting ready to hear, but you're here and you're going to hear it. Amen. And uh, saved, saved. Let's read the scripture, Luke 6, verse 2 through 14. So it was while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for him for them in the inn. Now there were keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth good will toward men. Hallelujah. God help us today to see from this scripture. Truths perhaps we've never seen before. Revive in us, as the psalmist said, the joy of our salvation. God, whatever it is, wherever individuals or we may be this morning, take your word and speak to us, Lord. Amen and amen. Just you saw it right in the scripture. For this day is born to you in the city of David a Savior. And I want to start right there. There is a Savior. He is the Savior. There's nothing else that's the Savior. He is the Savior. He was born as the Savior. And since there is a Savior, there must then be... Something about the root of that word that tells us what he came to do. If that's his title, what did he come to do? To save. Wow, we got brilliance in the room today. To save. <laughs> Look at your neighbor and tell him you're brilliant today. You're brilliant today. Saved. Yeah, if there's a need of a Savior, then apparently there's something or someone that needs to be saved. Good guy, he just saves somebody from the villain right at the end. I mean, the suspense, you know, and I mean, don't, don't you love those movies and things like, you know, just yeah, there's a Savior. Somebody's got to be saved, whether, whether, whatever the case might be. We love the stories that have a good ending. I don't watch documentaries or stuff like that much because I don't like bad endings. I like the movies. Amen? Stuff that's not so real so it really has a good ending. Right? I mean, they're in trouble, but somebody saved the day. Amen? Somebody was lonely and somebody saved the day. We love the stories of salvation, but the greatest story of salvation is 
through our Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. That's our Savior. But because He is a Savior, it speaks of the need for someone or something to be saved. So let's see if this language is in the Bible. And I was surprised. One of the reasons I'm actually preaching it this morning is because I was surprised that from beginning to end, this word was everywhere. The Psalms are filled with it. The, you're going to save me. The God, my rock, is my salvation. God saves us. I mean, on and on and on it goes and talks about saving and a salvation and a Savior. Let's go through the scriptures before I get carried away and just uh, 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 miss out on these. So let's go through a couple. John 3, verse 17. John 3, verse 17. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. Oh, I like it, don't you? I could stop right there at that verse. I mean, apparently it even shows us what salvation is. He didn't come to condemn us, but to save us. So the salvation must include the removal of condemnation. Woo! Glory, hallelujah. Yes, he didn't come to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Let's, let's look at the language. Just I picked out only a few of a lot. John 10, verse 9. Jesus speaking, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved. Yeah, he'll be saved. We'll go in and out and find pasture. Acts 2, verse 47, the early church now is, is this is the, the beginning of the, of the church age. And look how they talked and how God revealed things. Acts chapter 2, verse 47, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Acts chapter 16, verse 30 and 31. They're asked, a person asks them, says, He brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Sirs, what must I do to be saved? So they said, they gave him an answer. So they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved and you and your household. That verse right there, if you can just pop up verse 30 one more time. The, the, the question, what must I do to be saved? That was even asked of Jesus when he was on the earth. What must we do to be saved? Tells us very clearly that in the heart of a human, there is that cry, what is it that saves me? It's, it seems to be built into our, I, I was going to say DNA, but I, I maybe just use it figuratively, you know, but it seems to be in the human heart. What must I do to be saved? You don't have to, I mean, you just ask people questions and you realize that just like this story, people are asking the question, what and how? Can I be saved? They may not even verbalize it necessarily, but people look for either a religion, their own works, their own system of something, and they'll give that to you as their salvation. The good news. Oh, and that's why Jesus came with heavenly announcement. 
That's why Jesus came with a host of heavenly angels. That's why Jesus came with a cloud of glory. That's why Jesus came with rejoicing around him. Everything had to respond because he didn't come to bring us another system. He came to bring us the presence of God. And with him came presence. When he was born, heavenly hosts surrounded. Glory filled the place. Because I, I, Emmanuel, God with us. God didn't come to put another system in place, but rather to redeem us from every system that couldn't provide his presence. And came to bring God's presence to us in absolute certainty because it doesn't depend on anything or anyone other than him and his own perfection. So the question is, What did God come to save us from? There's lots of scriptures and you can do some study on your own. And I decided not to go too deep this morning, but just really summarize it up in a, in a way that we can just all get it real quickly. It, it, it boils right down to this. He came to save us from separation with himself. Hallelujah. There is a hell. There is an afterlife. There are, scriptures are clear about that, but a big part of that is separation from God. So people who are separated from God are actually living a living hell now. And God came to save us from it and bring us back together. There are, there are many, many scriptures we could go into, but I just, I, I got to tell you, Jesus came to save us from separation with God. We are saved. Hallelujah, because uh, New Testament, and these are words that shouldn't even, you know, in our modern culture, people want us just to stay away from, but it actually says we're saved from the wrath of God. Well, the wrath of God is separation. (laughs) When they sinned, what did he do? Drove them out. When When the prodigal son When the prodigal son, you know the story, don't you? You can go read it sometime, and I'm just going to assume you're all Sunday school folks and know the story. It's a pretty popular one. And so the prodigal son, you know, if you remember it, he says to his father, Hey, why wait till you die for my inheritance? Uh, I'd like to have my inheritance now. Give me the things that belong to me. And then the prodigal son, and this is something people miss in that scripture a lot of times, the very next thing he does is, does anybody know? He leaves the father's house. And you know the end of that move, don't you? A pig pen. So what do we see right there? As soon as things become our focus, it separates us from God. You'll you'll leave him if things are your focus. That's why religion isn't the answer. That's why doing more stuff isn't the answer. The the answer and what we've been saved from and saved to is, is from separation and we've been saved to his presence. What can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus? Woo, hallelujah. I could almost get excited right here with Christmas trees around me. 
I mean, even if it's Christmas, you could get excited about this stuff because he came to save us from separation from God. And since it's in him, it means that it never wavers, it never gets weak, it lasts eternally. Friend, we are secure in Christ. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. As soon as the prodigal son's focus was things, give me the things, the presence left. Our own righteousness is as filthy rags. Our own works. We're redeemed from the works of the law. We are redeemed from the curse of the law. We're redeemed. The handwriting that was against us was taken to the cross and nailed there and taken away forever. Hallelujah. This is what Emmanuel came to do. The prodigal son, as soon as he got things and that was his focus... Doesn't, it was certainly his inheritance, wasn't it? But as soon as the things became the focus, where did he end up? We all know it, don't we? It's a pig pen. Because it doesn't matter what we have or don't have if we don't have his presence. We're in a living pig pen. Oh, show it that. Oh, excuse me. I almost spoke in tongues. <laughs> Woo! Hallelujah! Yes! And so he gets down there and he comes to himself. So what's the cure? What's the cure? Huh? Yeah, what's the cure for the pig pen? What's the cure for the presence? And he begins to come to his senses and he goes, in my father's house. If I'm in his presence, there everything. Oh, hallelujah. If I'm in the father's house, everything that I thought I wanted and needed and things, that's where they actually are. It's not the things, it's the presence. Oh, thank you, Jesus. That's why God the Father, and I'm using human terms to just try to describe it. I'm sure it does nowhere near justice. But God the Father had to have been sitting on the edge of his seat just waiting for the redemptive work to be finished so that he could pour out his spirit on all flesh so that you and I could be united with him again in the way that he meant for it to be without any hindrance, without any requirements for it. It's in him. So what's the cure for the pig pen? What's the cure for hell, which is separation from God? I didn't say that was all of hell, but separation is hell. And so, and so, what is the cure for it? We find it right with the story of the prodigal son. He said, I'm not worthy to be called. My father's son. I'm not worthy to be a son. Now, if you're preaching it from another angle or looking at it, you may miss the significance of that. That is when he returned to his senses. Because when we realize we have nothing to offer, 
is when we can put all our trust in him. And that is where the presence of God, that is where we are saved from and to. That is the end of the pig pen, the end of separation. As long as a person holds up their own works, their own religion, their own good deeds, their own whatever they hold up, as long as they hold that up, it will keep you in the pig pen. But as soon as you say, I have no nothing. Those who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. The rescue. And did I tell you? I didn't tell you, did I? Saved means to be rescued from all harm and calamity. Rescued means to be saved, or excuse me, saved means to be rescued from all harm and calamity. And what is the calamity and harm for us that we're saved from? Separation from God. Because friend, if you read the Bible story, separation from God starts everything in a downward spiral. Thorns are going to grow instead of good stuff. The earth has a problem. Darkness comes. People's hearts are dark. Oh, I mean, there's a downward spiral as soon as they had to leave the garden. But Paul saw a man in Christ brought back to the garden. Oh, ho, ho, ho. hallelujah. Yes. So the prodigal son, remember him? We're still in that story. <laughs> We're still right there. The prodigal son says, I'm not worthy. For hyper-faith people, that seems to be a bad confession. But it would do people a lot of good every day to say, I'm not worthy. And we know what we mean. We don't mean that God doesn't love us or that we're not as loved as Jesus himself. What we mean is this worthiness, this presence, this that God has brought us to has nothing to do with me. It is all about Jesus. And he has swung the door wide open so that whoever enters that door shall be saved. And the, I, didn't, I, I didn't take the time, but I read a lot of those scriptures, and by now some of you have connected some of the dots. Even the one about the door, they shall come in and out, in and out. Others that I read talking about uh, uh, the presence, what's it saying? When you come through that door, there's access to the presence. He's with me, and nothing can separate me from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. i got to finish the prodigal son. The prodigal son, I'm not worthy. That's, that's big stuff. Until someone comes to that place, they're not really ready to trust Jesus. Because if there's anything else we're going to put our trust in, we're not really ready to call on him out of the sinking water and the miry clay and reach up and go, Jesus, save me. That's the moment, I believe, of his salvation. Then he goes back to the Father's house with no plea. Billy Graham made it so famous, you know. Just as I am without one plea, but that your blood was shed for me, and that bids me Come to the holy land of God. I come. <laughs> There's 
There's theology in that, in that, in that. You bid me come. Shoo. presence of God. Wow. Nothing can separate me. Oh. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Give you praise. Give you praise. The prodigal son comes back to the father's house. And tells him, I'm not worthy. And what does the father do? Go get him the robe. Go get him the ring. Put the stuff of sonship on him. Because <laughs> when we give up all of our, all of our salvation, means of our salvation, we're ready to accept the grace of God and the mercy of God that says, welcome home. Because when, that's why churches are filled, people are in the world, all over the world, people think they have a form of godliness but deny its power, what are they denying? The joy of his presence. Because if your focus is things, it takes you from his presence to the pig pen and there's no joy down there. You're always looking for something more, something more, another thing to do, another thing to add, another something. I mean, I mean the desperation for how-to books, to, for another 12 steps to this or that, shows us we're always looking for something. As long as our focus is on something, we will be thinking, man, we got the inheritance, but we're in the pig pen. But when they came back to the Father's house, completely on the mercy and grace of God, he went into the house and the party began. <laughs> the joy of my salvation. The party begins, my friend, when there's no dependence on you because there's presence. The party, the joy, the joy of our salvation, the glory of our redemption, the wonder of his presence in my life is found in his presence, not in the things he gives me or the things I can present. If I have him and I'm with him, I have it all. I'm telling you, I've got it all. I don't need something else. The party is in the Father's house, not with a bunch of stuff out of His presence. No wonder churches aren't filled with joy because they're filled with talking about things. And now we, we, we try to satisfy with more and we have to have more and we build more and we do more and we, 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 do, we just have, I mean, it's like there's an insatiable desire with people for more. We just got to do more. We, we just got to be more. We just got to see. We got to, just got, I mean, if you, have, if you have it this way to this week, it's got to be better next week. And we got, <sighs> 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 My contention is, is because our focus has become things and not his presence. You can take it, friend, with the illustration of a family. With the illustration of a family, you know, when we just celebrated this week, I told, we told you last Sunday, our 25th wedding anniversary, you know, and when we first uh, uh, met each other and we decided to get married and all that, is there a Kleenex box down there somewhere? I didn't bring a handkerchief or anything. Thank you so much. Yeah, this stuff gets me all emotional. I've got tears running down my face. <sighs> Uh, 
And anyway, uh, when we first got married, we, we literally said stuff like this to each other. It doesn't matter what life brings. Whether we live in a nice house or not so nice a house. Whether we ever drive a new car, don't drive a new I mean, I don't know that we named everything, but I mean, we just, this is how we talk to each other. Uh, it doesn't really matter as long as we've got each other. Didn't you say that kind of stuff to your, your spouse, your family? As long as we've got each other. And you know it, you know it, don't you? I mean, children don't complain. Spouses don't complain when they have their family. I've never heard children who have an intact, loving family unit, father, mother, family, loving, grace flowing, uh, forgiveness going on. I've never heard children go, man, I, I hate we don't have what, I, you know, we live in this four-bedroom house, but we have friends live in a 30-bedroom house. And I've never heard children talk like that. What I have heard people talk about is we had everything, but we didn't have presence. And that was hell. You can hear it in their voices. You can hear it in the pain in their heart. So when presence isn't there, things become important. But when presence is there, things take on much less significant. Uh, I, I'm still illustrating it because you got a couple, a, a family. You got a couple, a, a husband and a wife, and you know they're living together. They're going through trials and they go through debts and ups and downs of the economy and they go through, I mean, they just kind of go through everything. They go through it together. But then they decide to get divorced. And they'll spend years in court arguing over things. Because as soon as presence goes, things take on a place they never should have. When presence goes, friend, church, relationship, God, the Bible, these are not things. They're about God's presence. He came to save us from separation with Him. And did He ever do a good job? He saved us eternally from all our good works, from all our bad works, from all our failures, from all of our successes, we can bring none of them up as merit to have his presence. We trust in the name of our Lord, our God, and we shall be saved. Oh, hallelujah. And the party, friend, is in the Father's house. It's not in the things. Even the one that was toiling in the kingdom, the elder brother came in and said, you know, I've been doing all this and he's never given me these things. He never threw a party because there is no joy in trying to work for your stuff and your salvation. There is joy in the presence of God. In his presence is full. Of joy. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. What can separate us from the love of God? John chapter 8, verse 36. We better finish right here. Therefore, whom the Son makes free is free indeed. Free from what? Free from eternal separation. Free from separation from God. Free from the pig pen. And free to live in the joy of the Father's house.
in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go and I prepare a place for you. That where I am, there you may be also. How are we going to know? How are we going to get there? We don't even know where it is. We, we don't know the way. And Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, the life. He's the cure. He's the anchor of our salvation. He's the surety of God's presence. He came, Emmanuel, God with us. Hallelujah. With every head bowed and every eye closed, as the worship team comes and gets ready, lead us in some worship. Not another ritual, but a relationship with God. Trust. Scriptures are very, very clear that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. It's just filled with that word, believe. That's not a system, my friend. That's trust. <laughs> How hard is it for you this morning to go, I trust Him. Believing is not another system of something that merits your salvation. Believing is saying, I trust the revealed truth of Jesus Christ. The trust for the salvation that all mankind is looking for. They're looking for it in good works. They're looking for it in religious ways. They're looking for it in, in their, their own, uh, what the modern thing is, believing something, as long as you believe something. The most modern thing, folks, that has always been modern is putting all our trust in God as the anchor and the source of our salvation. Every head bowed and every eye closed. Will you today put all your faith and trust in Jesus Christ for your life and eternity? Would you slip up your hand and say, yeah, that's me. That's me. All my faith, all my trust. Wherever you are, just lift your hand up and just say, yeah, that's me. I'm putting all my faith If you're, if you're bringing something of your own, you're not ready for this. But if you're able to say, I want to put all my trust in Him. You can put your hands down if you lifted them for that one second invitation. I want to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Receive that promise of the Father. Would you lift your hand up? Say, yeah, I'm, I'm ready. I want to be filled with the Holy Spirit today. In Jesus' name. You can put your hands down on that one. And then the third one, I have something going on in my life. I have something going on, a, a prayer request, a, somebody I'm concerned about, something in my life. And I want to put all my trust in God for the answer, for the miracle the healing. Would you slip your hand up and say, yeah. Just indicate to God, I trust Him. I trust Him. Give you all the praise, all the glory. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Let's stand together, would you? Let's just begin as get ready to worship God. <clears throat> Look, when Jesus came and the presence of God came with him, heavenly hosts, there was singing, there was worship. The presence of God is different than a system. The presence of God is... 
I just don't know how to say it. The presence of God. Give you praise. Let's say it together. I believe in Jesus Christ. I put all my faith, all my trust in him for my life and eternity. I call on his name and I am saved. Jesus name. Now fill me with the Holy Spirit. I receive the promise of the Father in his name. I cast all my care on the Lord because he cares for me. I trust him for my healing, a miracle, the answers, the blessings, all about my life. I trust him in Jesus name. Come on, let's worship him. Honor him.